Chapter 5, Winter Night. The sun stood halfway down from its noonday high by the time the cart reached the farmhouse. It was not a big house, not nearly so large as some of the sprawling farmhouses to the east, dwellings that had grown over the years to hold entire families. In the two rivers, that often included three or four generations under one roof, including aunts, uncles, cousins, and nephews. Tam and Rand were considered out of the ordinary as much for being two men living alone as for farming in the Westwood. Here most of the rooms were on one floor, a neat rectangle with no wings or additions. Two bedrooms and an attic storeroom fitted up under the steeply sloped thatch. If the whitewash was all but gone from the stout wooden walls after the winter storms, the house was still in a tidy state of repair, the thatch tightly mended and the doors and shutters well hung in snug fitting. House, barn, and stone sheep pen formed the points of a triangle around the farmyard, where a few chickens had ventured out to scratch at the cold ground. An open shearing shed and a stone dipping trough stood next to the sheep pen. Hard by the fields between the farmyard and the trees loomed the tall cone of a tight-walled curing shed. Few farmers in the two rivers could make do without both wool and tabac to sell when the merchants came. When Rand took a look in the stone pen, the heavy-horned herd ram looked back at him, but most of the black-faced flock remained placidly where they lay or stood with their heads in the feed trough. Their coats were thick and curly, but it was still too cold for shearing. I don't think the black-cloaked man came here, Rand called to his father, who was walking slowly around the farmhouse, spear held at the ready, examining the ground intently. The sheep wouldn't be so settled if that one had been around. Tam nodded but did not stop. When he had made a complete circuit of the house, he did the same around the barn and the sheep pen, still studying the ground. He even checked the smokehouse and the curing shed. Drawing a bucket of water from the well, he filled a cupped hand, sniffed the water, and gingerly touched it with the tip of his tongue. Abruptly he barked a laugh, then drank it down in a quick gulp. I suppose he didn't, he told Rand, wiping his hand on his coat front. All this about men and horses I can't see or hear just makes me look crossways at everything. He emptied the well water into another bucket and started for the house, the bucket in one hand and his spear in the other. I'll start some stew for supper. And as long as we're here, we might as well get caught up on a few chores. Rand grimaced, regretting winter night in Emmons Field. But Tam was right. Around a farm the work never really got done. As soon as one thing was finished two more always needed doing. He hesitated about it, but kept his bow and quiver close at hand. If the dark rider did appear, he had no intention of facing him with nothing but a hoe. First was stabling Bella. Once he had unharnessed her and put her into a stall in the barn next to their cow, he set his cloak aside and rubbed the mare down with handfuls of dry straw, then kirkeried her with a pair of brushes. Climbing the narrow ladder to the loft, he pitched down hay for her feed. He fetched a scoopful of oats for her as well, though there was little enough left and might be no more for a long while unless the weather warmed soon. The cow had been milked that morning before first light, giving a quarter of her usual yield, she seemed to be drying up as the winter hung on. Enough feed had been left to see the sheep for two days, they should have been in the pasture by now, but there was none worth calling it so, but he topped off their water. Whatever eggs had been laid needed to be gathered too. There were only three. The hens seemed to be getting cleverer at hiding them. He was taking a hoe to the vegetable garden behind the house, when Tam came out and settled on a bench in front of the barn to mend harness, propping his spear beside him. It made Rand feel better about the bow lying on his cloak a pace from where he stood. Few weeds had pushed above ground, but more weeds than anything else. The cabbages were stunted, barely a sprout of the beans or peas showed, and there was not a sign of a beet. Not everything had been planted, of course, only part, in hopes the cold might break in time, to make a crop of some kind before the cellar was empty. It did not take long to finish hoeing, which would have suited him just fine in years past, but now he wondered what they would do if nothing came up this year. Not a pleasant thought. And there was still firewood to split. It seemed to Rand like years since there had not been firewood to split. But complaining would not keep the house warm, so he fetched the axe, propped up bow and quiver beside the chopping block, and got to work. Pine for a quick hot flame, and oak for long burning. Before long he was warm enough to put his coat aside. When the pile of split wood grew big enough, he stacked it against the side of the house, beside other stacks already there. Most reached all the way to the eaves. Usually by this time of year the wood piles were small and few, but not this year. Chop and stack, chop and stack, he lost himself in the rhythm of the axe and the motions of stacking wood.
Tam's hand on his shoulder brought him back to where he was, and for a moment he blinked in surprise. Great twilight had come on while he worked, and already it was fading quickly toward night. The full moon stood well above the treetops, shimmering pale and bulging, as if about to fall on their heads. The wind had grown colder without his noticing too, and tattered clouds scudded across the darkling sky. Let's wash up, lad, and see about some supper. I've already carried in water for hot baths before sleep. Anything hot sounds good to me, Rand said, snatching up his cloak and tossing it round his shoulders. Sweat soaked his shirt, and the wind, forgotten in the heat of swinging the axe, seemed to be trying to freeze it now that he had stopped work. He stifled a yawn, shivering as he gathered the rest of his things. And sleep too, for that. I might just sleep right through festival. Would you care to make a small wager about that? Tam smiled, and Rand had to grin back. He would not miss bell time if he had had no sleep in a week. No one would. Tam had been extravagant with the candles, and a fire crackled in the big stone fireplace, so that the main room had a warm, cheerful feel to it. A broad oaken table was the main feature of the room other than the fireplace, a table long enough to seat a dozen or more, though there had seldom been so many around it since Rand's mother died. A few cabinets and chests, most of them skillfully made by Tam himself, lined the walls, and high back chairs stood around the table. The cushion chair, that Tam called his reading chair sat angled before the flames. Rand preferred to do his reading stretched out on the rug in front of the fire. The shelf of books by the door was not nearly as long as the one at the Winespring Inn, but books were hard to come by. Few peddlers carried more than a handful, and those had to be stretched out among everyone who wanted them. If the room did not look quite so freshly scrubbed as most farm wives kept their homes, Tam's pipe rack and the travels of Jane Farstrider sat on the table, while another wood-bound book rested on the cushion of his reading chair, a bit of harness to be mended, lay on the bench by the fireplace, and some shirts to be darned, made a heap on a chair, if not quite so spotless, it was still clean and neat enough, with a lived-in look that was almost as warming and comforting as the fire. Here, it was possible to forget the chill beyond the walls. There was no false dragon here. No wars or A's, said I. No men in black cloaks. The aroma from the stew pot hanging over the fire permeated the room and filled Rand with ravenous hunger. His father stirred the stew pot with a long handled wooden spoon, then took a taste. A little while longer. Rand hurried to wash his face and hands. There was a pitcher and basin on the washstand by the door. A hot bath was what he wanted to take away the sweat and soak the chill out, but that would come when there had been time to heat the big kettle in the back room. Tam rooted around in a cabinet and came up with a key, as long as his hand. He twisted it in the big iron lock on the door. At Rand's questioning look he said, best to be safe. Maybe I'm taking a fancy, or maybe the weather is blacking my mood, but. He sighed and bounced the key on his palm. I'll see to the back door, he said, and disappeared toward the back of the house. Rand could not remember either door ever being locked. No one in the two rivers locked doors. There was no need. Until now, at least. From overhead, from Tam's bedroom, came a scraping, as of something being dragged across the floor. Rand frowned. Unless Tam had suddenly decided to move the furniture around, he could only be pulling out the old chest he kept under his bed. Another thing that had never been done in Rand's memory. He filled a small kettle with water for tea and hung it from a hook over the fire, then set the table. He had carved the bowls and spoons himself. The front shutters had not yet been closed, and from time to time he peered out, but full night had come, and all he could see were moon shadows. The dark rider could be out there easily enough, but he tried not to think about that. When Tam came back, Rand stared in surprise. A thick belt slanted around Tam's waist, and from the belt hung a sword, with a bronze heron on the black scabbard, and another on the long hilt. The only men Rand had ever seen wearing swords were the merchant's guards. And Lan, of course. That his father might own one had never even occurred to him. Except for the herons, the sword looked a good deal like Lan's sword. Where did that come from, he asked. Did you get it from a peddler? How much did it cost? Slowly Tam drew the weapon. Firelight played along the gleaming length. It was nothing at all like the plain, rough blades Rand had seen in the hands of merchant's guards. No gems or gold adorned it but it seemed grand to him, nonetheless. The blade, very slightly curved, and sharp on only one edge, bore another hair and etched into the steel. Short quillins, worked to look like braid, flanked the hilt. It seemed almost fragile compared with the swords of the merchant's guards, 
most of those were double-edged and thick enough to chop down a tree. I got it a long time ago, Tam said, a long way from here. And I paid entirely too much. Two coppers is too much for one of these. Your mother didn't approve, but she was always wiser than I was young then, and it seemed worth the price at the time. She always wanted me to get rid of it, and more than once I've thought she was right, that I should just give it away. Reflected fire made the blade seem aflame. Rand started. He had often daydreamed about owning a sword. Give it away? How could you give a sword like that away? Tam snorted. Not much use in herding sheep, now is it? Can't plow a field or harvest a crop with it. For a long minute he stared at the sword, as if wondering what he was doing with such a thing. At last he let out a heavy sigh. But if I am not just taken by a black fancy, if our luck runs sour, maybe in the next few days we'll be glad I tucked it in that old chest, instead. He slid the sword smoothly back into its sheath and wiped his hand on his shirt with a grimace. The stew should be ready. I'll dish it out while you fix the tea. Rand nodded and got the tea canister, but he wanted to know everything. Why would Tam have bought a sword? He could not imagine. And where had Tam come by it? How far away? No one ever left the two rivers, or very few, at least. He had always vaguely supposed his father must have gone outside, his mother had been an outlander, but a sword? He had a lot of questions to ask once they had settled at the table. The tea water was boiling fiercely, and he had to wrap a cloth around the kettle's handle to lift it off the hook. Heat soaked through immediately. As he straightened from the fire, a heavy thump at the door rattled the lock. All thoughts of the sword, or the hot kettle in his hand, flew away. One of the neighbors, he said uncertainly. Master Daughtry wanted to borrow. But the Daughtry farm, their nearest neighbor, was an hour away even in the daylight, and Oren Daughtry, shameless borrower that he was, was still not likely to leave his house by dark. Tam softly placed the stew-filled bowls on the table. Slowly he moved away from the table. Both of his hands rested on his sword hilt. I don't think, he began, and the door burst open, pieces of the iron lock spinning across the floor. A figure filled the doorway, bigger than any man Rand had ever seen, a figure in black mail that hung to his knees, with spikes at wrists and elbows and shoulders. One hand clutched a heavy, scythe-like sword, the other hand was flung up before his eyes, as if to shield them from the light. Rand felt the beginnings of an odd sort of relief. Whoever this was, it was not the black cloaked rider. Then he saw the curled ram's horns on the head, that brushed the top of the doorway, and where mouth and nose should have been, was a hairy muzzle. He took in all of it in the space of one deep breath, that he let out in a terrified yell as, without thinking, he hurled the hot kettle at that half-human head. The creature roared, heart scream of pain, heart animal snarl, as boiling water splashed over its face. Even as the kettle struck, Tam's sword flashed. The roar abruptly became a gurgle, and the huge shape toppled back. Before it finished falling, another was trying to claw its way past. Rand glimpsed a misshapen head topped by spike-like horns before Tam struck again, and two huge bodies blocked the door. He realized his father was shouting at him. Run, lad. Hide in the woods. The bodies in the doorway jerked as others outside tried to pull them clear. Tam thrust a shoulder under the massive table. With a grunt he heaved it over atop the tangle. There are too many to hold. Out the back. Go. Go. I'll follow. Even as Rand turned away, shame filled him that he obeyed so quickly. He wanted to stay and help his father, though he could not imagine how, but fear had him by the throat, and his legs moved on their own. He dashed from the room, toward the back of the house, as fast as he had ever run in his life. Crashes and shouts from the front door pursued him. He had his hands on the bar across the back door, when his eye fell on the iron lock that was never locked. Except that Tam had done just that tonight. Letting the bar stay where it was, he darted to a side window, flung up the sash, and threw back the shutters. Night had replaced twilight completely. The full moon and drifting clouds made dappled shadows chase one another across the farmyard. Shadows, he told himself. Only shadows. The back door creaked as someone outside, or something, tried to push it open. His mouth went dry. A crash shook the door in its frame, and lent him speed. He slipped through the window like a hare going to ground, and cowered against the side of the house. Inside the room, wood splintered like thunder. He forced himself up to a crouch, made himself peer inside, just with one eye, just at the corner of the window. In the dark he could not make out much, but more than he really wanted to see. The door hung askew, and shadowed shapes moved cautiously into the room, talking in low, guttural voices.
Rand understood none of what was said. The language sounded harsh, unsuited to a human tongue. Axes and spears and spiked things dully reflected stray glimmers of moonlight. Boots scraped on the floor, and there was a rhythmic click, as of hooves, as well. He tried to work moisture back into his mouth. Drawing a deep, ragged breath, he shouted as loudly as he could. They're coming in the back. The words came out in a croak, but at least they came out. He had not been sure they would. I'm outside. Run, father. With the last word he was sprinting away from the farmhouse. Coarse-voiced shouts in the strange tongue raged from the back room. Glass shattered, loud and sharp, and something thudded heavily to the ground behind him. He guessed one of them had broken through the window, rather than try to squeeze through the opening, but he did not look back to see if he was right. Like a fox running from hounds he darted into the nearest moon cast shadows, as if headed for the woods, then dropped to his belly and slithered back to the barn and its larger deeper shadows. Something fell across his shoulders, and he thrashed about, not sure if he was trying to fight or escape, until he realized he was grappling with the new hoe handle Tam had been shaping. Idiot. For a moment he lay there, trying to stop panting. Copland fool idiot. At last he crawled on along the back of the barn, dragging the hoe handle with him. It was not much, but it was better than nothing. Cautiously he looked around the corner at the farmyard and the house. Of the creature that had jumped out after him there was no sign. It could be anywhere. Hunting him, surely. Even creeping up on him at that very moment. Frightened bleats filled the sheep pen to his left. The flock milled, as if trying to find an escape. Shadowed shapes flickered in the lighted front windows of the house, and the clash of steel on steel rang through the darkness. Suddenly one of the windows burst outward in a shower of glass and wood as Tam leaped through it, sword still in hand. He landed on his feet, but instead of running away from the house he dashed toward the back of it, ignoring the monstrous things scrambling after him through the broken window and the doorway. Rand stared in disbelief. Why was he not trying to get away? Then he understood. Tam had last heard his voice from the rear of the house. Father, he shouted. I'm over here. In mid-stride Tam whirled, not running toward Rand, but at an angle away from him. Run, lad, he shouted, gesturing with the sword, as if to someone ahead of him. Hide. A dozen huge forms streamed after him, harsh shouts and shrill howls shivering the air. Rand pulled back into the shadows behind the barn. There he could not be seen from the house, in case any of the creatures were still inside. He was safe, for the moment, at least. But not Tam. Tam, who was trying to lead those things away from him. His hands tightened on the hoe handle, and he had to clench his teeth to stop a sudden laugh. A hoe handle. Facing one of those creatures with a hoe handle would not be much like playing at quarterstaffs with Perrin. But he could not let Tam face what was chasing him alone. If I move like I was stalking a rabbit, he whispered to himself, they'll never hear me or see me. The eerie cries echoed in the darkness, and he tried to swallow. More like a pack of starving wolves. Soundlessly he slipped away from the barn, toward the forest, gripping the hoe handle so hard that his hands hurt. At first, when the trees surrounded him, he took comfort from them. They helped hide him from whatever the creatures were that had attacked the farm. As he crept through the woods, though, moon shadows shifted, and it began to seem as if the darkness of the forest changed and moved too. Trees loomed malevolently, branches writhed toward him. But were they just trees and branches? He could almost hear the growling chuckles stifled in their throats while they waited for him. The howls of Tam's pursuers no longer filled the night, but in the silence that replaced them, he flinched every time the wind scraped one limb against another. Lower and lower he crouched and moved more and more slowly. He hardly dared to breathe for fear he might be heard. Suddenly a hand closed over his mouth from behind and an iron grip seized his wrist. Frantically he clawed over his shoulder with his free hand for some hold on the attacker. Don't break my neck, lad, came Tam's hoarse whisper. Relief flooded him, turning his muscles to water. When his father released him, he fell to his hands and knees, gasping as if he had run for miles. Tam dropped down beside him, leaning on one elbow. I wouldn't have tried that if I had thought how much you've grown in the last few years, Tam said softly. His eyes shifted constantly as he spoke, keeping a sharp watch on the darkness. But I had to make sure you didn't speak out. Some Trollocs can hear like a dog. Maybe better. But Trollocs are just. Rand let the words trail off. Not just a story, not after tonight. Those things could be Trollocs or the Dark One himself for all he knew. Are you sure? He whispered. I mean Trollocs? I'm sure. Though what brought them to the two rivers?
I never saw one before tonight, but I've talked with men who have, so I know a little. Maybe enough to keep us alive. Listen closely. A Trala can see better than a man in the dark, but bright lights blind them, for a time at least. That may be the only reason we got away from so many. Some can track by center sound, but they're said to be lazy. If we can keep out of their hands long enough, they should give up. That made Rand feel only a little better. In the stories they hate men, and serve the Dark One. If anything belongs in the shepherd of the night's flocks, lad, it is Trollocs. They kill for the pleasure of killing, so I've been told. But that's the end of my knowledge, except that they cannot be trusted, unless they're afraid of you, and then not far. Rand shivered. He did not think he would want to meet anyone a Trolloc was afraid of. Do you think they're still hunting for us? Maybe, maybe not. They don't seem very smart. Once we got into the forest, I sent the ones after me off toward the mountains without much trouble. Tam fumbled at his right side, then put his hand close to his face. Best act as if they are, though. You're hurt. Keep your voice down. It's just a scratch, and there is nothing to be done about it now, anyway. At least the weather seems to be warming. He lay back with a heavy sigh. Perhaps it won't be too bad spending the night out. In the back of his mind Rand had just been thinking fond thoughts of his coat and cloak. The trees cut the worst of the wind, but what gusted through still sliced like a frozen knife. Hesitantly he touched Tam's face, and winced. You're on fire. I have to get you to Nineveh. In a bit, lad. We don't have any time to waste. It's a long way in the dark. He scrambled to his feet and tried to pull his father up. A groan barely stifled by Tam's clenched teeth made Rand hastily ease him back down. Let me rest a while, boy. I'm tired. Rand pounded his fist on his thigh. Snug in the farmhouse, with a fire and blankets, plenty of water and willow bark, he might have been willing to wait for daybreak, before hitching Bella and taking Tam into the village. Here was no fire, no blankets, no cart, and no Bella. But those things were still back at the house. If he could not carry Tam to them, perhaps he could bring some of them, at least, to Tam. If the Trollocs were gone. They had to go sooner or later. He looked at the hoe handle, then dropped it. Instead he drew Tam's sword. The blade gleamed dully in the pale moonlight. The long hilt felt odd in his hand, the weight and heft were strange. He slashed at the air a few times, before stopping with a sigh. Slashing at air was easy. If he had to do it against a trollic he was surely just as likely to run instead, or freeze stiff, so he could not move at all until the trollic swung one of those odd swords and stop it. It's not helping anything. As he started to rise, Tam caught his arm. Where are you going? We need the cart, he said gently. And blankets. He was shocked at how easily he pulled his father's hand from his sleeve. Rest, and I'll be back. Careful, Tam breathed. He could not see Tam's face in the moonlight, but he could feel his eyes on him. I will be. As careful as a mouse exploring a hawk's nest, he thought. As silently as another shadow, he slid into the darkness. He thought of all the times he had played tag in the woods with his friends as children, stalking one another, straining not to be hurt until he put a hand on someone's shoulder. Somehow he could not make this seem the same. Creeping from tree to tree, he tried to make a plan, but by the time he reached the edge of the woods he had made and discarded ten. Everything depended on whether or not the Trollocs were still there. If they were gone, he could simply walk up to the house and take what he needed. If they were still there. In that case, there was nothing for it, but go back to Tam. He did not like it, but he could do Tam no good by getting killed. He peered toward the farm buildings. The barn and the sheep pen were only dark shapes in the moonlight. Light spilled from the front windows of the house, though, and through the open front door. Just a candle's father lit, or are there trollocs waiting? He jumped convulsively at a nighthawk's reedy cry, then sagged against a tree, shaking. This was getting him nowhere. Dropping to his belly, he began to crawl, holding the sword awkwardly before him. He kept his chin in the dirt all the way to the back of the sheep pen. Crouched against a stone wall, he listened. Not a sound disturbed the night. Carefully he eased up enough to look over the wall. Nothing moved in the farmyard. No shadows flickered against the lit windows of the house or in the doorway. Bella in the cart first, or the blankets and other things. It was the light that decided him. The barn was dark. Anything could be waiting inside, and he would have no way of knowing until it was too late. At least he would be able to see what was inside the house. As he started to lower himself again, he stopped suddenly. There was no sound, 
Most of the sheep might have settled down already and gone back to sleep, though it was not likely, but a few were always awake even in the middle of the night, rustling about, bleeding now and again. He could barely make out the shadowy mounds of sheep on the ground. One lay almost beneath him. Trying to make no noise, he hoisted himself onto the wall until he could stretch out a hand to the dim shape. His fingers touched curly wool, then wetness. The sheep did not move. Breath left him in a rush as he pushed back, almost dropping the sword as he fell to the ground outside the pen. They kill for fun. Shakily he scrubbed the wetness from his hand in the dirt. Fiercely he told himself that nothing had changed. The Trollocs had done their butchery and gone. Repeating that in his mind, he crawled on across the farmyard, keeping as low as he could, but trying to watch every direction too. He had never thought he would envy an earthworm. At the front of the house he lay close beside the wall, beneath the broken window, and listened. The dull thudding of blood in his ears was the loudest sound he heard. Slowly he reared up and peered inside. The stewpot lay upside down in the ashes on the hearth. Splintered, broken wood littered the room, not a single piece of furniture remained whole. Even the table rested at an angle, two legs hacked to rough stubs. Every drawer had been pulled out and smashed, every cupboard and cabinet stood open, many doors hanging by one hinge. Their contents were strewn over the wreckage, and everything was dusted with white. Flour and salt, to judge from the slashed sacks tossed down by the fireplace. Four twisted bodies made a tangle in the remnants of the furnishings. Trollocs. Rand recognized one by its ram's horns. The others were much the same, even in their differences, a repulsive melange of human faces distorted by muzzles, horns, feathers, and fur. Their hands, almost human, only made it worse. Two wore boots, the others had hooves. He watched without blinking until his eyes burned. None of the Trollocs moved. They had to be dead. And Tam was waiting. He ran in through the front door and stopped, gagging at the stench. A stable that had not been mucked out in months was the only thing he could think of that might come close to matching it. Vile smears defiled the walls. Trying to breathe through his mouth, he hurriedly began poking through the mess on the floor. There had been a water bag in one of the cupboards. A scraping sound behind him sent a chill to his marrow, and he spun, almost falling over the remains of the table. He caught himself and moaned behind teeth that would have chattered had he not of them clenched until his jaw ached. One of the Trollocs was getting to its feet. A wolf's muzzle jutted out below sunken eyes. Flat, emotionless eyes, and all too human. Hairy, pointed ears twitched incessantly. It stepped over one of its dead companions on sharp goat hooves. The same black male the others wore rasped against leather trousers, and one of the huge, scythe-curved swords swung at its side. It muttered something, guttural and sharp, then said, others go away. Narg stay. Narg smart. The words were distorted and hard to understand, coming from a mouth never meant for human speech. Its tone was meant to be soothing, he thought, but he could not take his eyes off the stained teeth, long and sharp, that flashed every time the creature spoke. Narg knows him come back sometime. Narg wait. You no need sword. Put sword down. Until the Trollocs spoke Rand had not realized that he held Tam's sword wavering before him in both hands, its point aimed at the huge creature. It towered head and shoulders above him, with a chest and arms to dwarf Master Luhan. Narg no hurt. It took a step closer, gesturing. You put sword down. The dark hair on the backs of its hands was thick, like fur. Stay back, Rand said, wishing his voice were steadier. Why did you do this? Why? Volja di Gragda. The snarl quickly became a toothy smile. Put sword down. Narg no hurt. Murdral won't talk you. A flash of emotion crossed the distorted face. Fear. Others come back, you talk Murdral. It took another step, one big hand coming to rest on its own sword hilt. You put sword down. Rand wet his lips. Murdral. The worst of the stories was walking tonight. If a fade was coming, it made a trollic pale by comparison. He had to get away. But if the trollic drew that massive blade he would not have a chance. He forced his lips into a shaky smile. All right. Grip tightening on the sword, he let both hands drop to his sides. I'll talk. The wolf smile became a snarl, and the trollic lunged for him. Rand had not thought anything that big could move so fast. Desperately he brought his sword up. The monstrous body crashed into him, slamming him against a wall. Breath left his lungs in one gasp. He fought for air as they fell to the floor together, the trollic on top. Frantically he struggled beneath the crushing weight, trying to avoid thick hands groping for him and snapping jaws.
Abruptly the Trollic spasmed and was still. Battered and bruised, half suffocated by the bulk on top of him, for a moment Rand could only lie there in disbelief. Quickly he came to his senses, though, enough to writhe out from under the body, at least. And body it was. The bloodied blade of Tam's sword stood out from the center of the Trollic's back. He had gotten it up in time after all. Blood covered Rand's hands, as well, and made a blackish smear across the front of his shirt. His stomach churned, and he swallowed hard to keep from being sick. He shook as hard as he had in the worst of his fear, but this time in relief at still being alive. Others come back, the Trollic had said. The other Trollocs would be returning to the farmhouse. And a murderal, a Fade. The stories said Fades were twenty feet tall, with eyes of fire, and they rode shadows like horses. When a Fade turned sideways, it disappeared, and no wall could stop them. He had to do what he had come for, and get away quickly. Grunting with the effort he heaved the Trollic's body over to get to the sword, and almost ran when open eyes stared at him. It took him a minute to realize they were staring through the glaze of death. He wiped his hands on a tattered rag, it had been one of Tam's shirts only that morning, and tugged the blade free. Cleaning the sword, he reluctantly dropped the rag on the floor. There was no time for neatness, he thought with a laugh that he had to clamp his teeth shut to stop. He did not see how they could ever clean the house well enough for it to be lived in again. The horrible stench had probably already soaked right into the timbers. But there was no time to think of that. No time for neatness. No time for anything, maybe. He was sure he was forgetting any number of things they would need, but Tam was waiting, and the Trollocs were coming back. He gathered what he could think of on the run. Blankets from the bedrooms upstairs, and clean cloths to bandage Tam's wound. Their cloaks and coats. A water bag that he carried when he took the sheep to pasture. A clean shirt. He did not know when he would have time to change, but he wanted to get out of his blood-smeared shirt at the first opportunity. The small bags of willow bark and their other medicines were part of a dark, muddy-looking pile he could not bring himself to touch. One bucket of the water Tam had brought and still stood by the fireplace, miraculously unspilled and untouched. He filled the water bag from it, gave his hands a hasty wash in the rest, and made one more quick search for anything he might have forgotten. He found his bow among the wreckage, broken cleanly in two at the thickest point. He shuddered as he let the pieces fall. What he had gathered already would have to do, he decided. Quickly he piled everything outside the door. The last thing, before leaving the house, he dug a shuttered lantern from the mess on the floor. It still held oil. Lighting it from one of the candles, he closed the shutters, partly against the wind, but mostly to keep from drawing attention, and hurried outside with the lantern in one hand, and the sword in the other. He was not sure what he would find in the barn. The sheep pen kept him from hoping too much. But he needed the cart to get Tam to Emmons Field, and for the cart he needed Bella. Necessity made him hope a little. The barn doors stood open, one creaking on its hinges as it shifted in the wind. The interior looked as it always had, at first. Then his eyes fell on empty stalls, the stall doors ripped from their hinges. Bella and the cow were gone. Quickly he went to the back of the barn. The cart lay on its side, half the spokes broken out of its wheels. One shaft was only a foot-long stump. The despair he had been holding at bay filled him. He was not sure he could carry Tam as far as the village, even if his father could bear to be carried. The pain of it might kill Tam more quickly than the fever. Still, it was the only chance left. He had done all he could do here. As he turned to go, his eyes fell on the hacked-off cart shaft lying on the straw-strewn floor. Suddenly he smiled. Hurriedly he set the lantern and the sword on the straw-covered floor, and in the next instant he was wrestling with the cart, tipping it back over to fall upright with a snap of more breaking spokes, then throwing his shoulder into it to heave it over on the other side. The undamaged shaft stood straight out. Snatching up the sword he hacked at the well-seasoned ash. To his pleased surprise great chips flew with his strokes, and he cut through as quickly as he could have with a good axe. When the shaft fell free, he looked at the sword blade in wonder. Even the best sharpened axe would have dulled chopping through that hard, aged wood, but the sword looked as brightly sharp as ever. He touched the edge with his thumb, then hastily stuck it in his mouth. The blade was still razor sharp. But he had no time for wonder. Blowing out the lantern, there was no need to have the barn burn down on top of everything else. He gathered up the shafts and ran back to get what he had left at the house. Altogether it made an awkward burden. Not a heavy one but hard to balance and manage, the cart shafts shifting and twisting in his arms as he stumbled across the plowed field.
Once back in the forest they were even worse, catching on trees and knocking him half off his feet. They would have been easier to drag, but that would leave a clear trail behind him. He intended to wait as long as possible before doing that. Tam was right where he had left him, seemingly asleep. He hoped it was sleep. Suddenly fearful, he dropped his burdens and put a hand to his father's face. Tam still breathed, but the fever was worse. The touch roused Tam, but only into a hazy wakefulness. Is that you, boy, he breathed. Worried about you. Dreams of days gone. Nightmares. Murmuring softly, he drifted off again. Don't worry, Rand said. He lay Tam's coat and cloak over him to keep off the wind. I'll get you to nine of just as quick as I can. As he went on, as much to reassure himself, as for Tam's benefit, he peeled off his bloodstained shirt, hardly even noticing the cold in his haste, to be rid of it, and hurriedly pulled on the clean one. Throwing his old shirt away made him feel as if he had just had a bath. We'll be safe in the village in no time, and the wisdom will set everything right. You'll see. Everything's going to be all right. That thought was like a beacon as he pulled on his coat and bent to tend Tam's wound. They would be safe once they reached the village, and Nynaeve would cure Tam. He just had to get him there. 